Welcome back. Joining me for a look at the day's markets action is Jordan Toy from Legacy Family Wealth. Jordan, thanks so much for joining us today. Now let's get started with um, looking at how markets have kicked off the week. Trade does seem a bit choppy. It does seem like we are seeing a cooling off that um, rates fueled rally that we saw last week. What is driving markets um, moving into the week? Are we just seeing uh, traders waiting for the next catalyst, perhaps the PCE print that's out on Friday? Yes, certainly. I think um, after that rate cut, I think it's been a bit of an inflection point. You know, we've been in a high rate environment for quite a while and, you know, markets are trying to digest, you know, are we at the start of a, sort of a new direction of travel. Um, and I think we saw that on the day as well. You know, markets were initially up quite a large amount, then ended flat, but you know, end of last week was quite strong. Markets clearly liked the direction of travel and that the soft landing is still um, potentially on the cards. I think even more so now, um, as you mentioned, PCE or inflation data coming um, going forward and, and labor market data is going to be critical because the market's going to be looking at that going, OK, is inflation under control? We've done a big rate cut. I think it would be quite a it leads to it can lead to quite a lot of volatility if we see inflation start to, to creep up again, especially after we've now sort of had the first rate cut, at least in the US and, and a smaller one here in South Africa. Just how concerned are markets when it comes to the U.S. labor market, considering how big um, the Fed's cut was, which then kind of, you know, fueled those fears around a recession? 100%. And I think that's, you know, to talk to that first day when the rate cut occurred, you know, markets were initially appeared to be quite, quite happy with mm -hmm. it. But I think as, as, you know, we've had more time to sort of digest, what is a bold rate cut like a 50 basis points rate cut that they did mean? I think, you know, off the bat, we go, well, this is, you know, good for markets, good for equities. Um, but then the realization starts to, I think, occur, well, you know, does that mean that the market's weaker than we think? I think it's on the balance of probabilities. The Fed was caught, you know, a bit slow at the start of this period. Remember when they were calling inflation transitory um, a year or two ago. So I think they're trying to, to get out the gates a little bit ahead of this. Um, but I think it's just something to, to keep a close eye on. Um, like I said, data going forward is going to be absolutely critical, both on the labor market side and inflation, to just see do those two still remain in balance. Let's move over to China now. So we had um, the Central Bank or the People's Bank of China cut um, a short-term lending rate in an attempt to boost the economy. Now, China has been holding back on some stimulus this year. Do you think this is just, you know, uh, um, one of those moments where they are now ready to unleash the stimulus, considering that growth or we aren't seeing the growth that they expected to come through? So I think... Um I think the market is looking for that, and yeah. we haven't seen it yet, right? So that rate cut you mentioned was was relatively minor. I believe it was 10 basis points. So it's so not a major move, and they've had a couple of those over the last couple of months. So I think I was quite surprised by that initially, you know, especially after the Fed rate cut. I thought that opened the door a bit more for them to, to, to you know, stimulate the economy a little bit more than they have. Um, and I think the market's largely sitting and waiting for that as well, looking for some, some bigger form of stimulus that, at least for now, doesn't seem to be, to be forthcoming. So, you know, we'll continue to see things sort of slowly move along. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that that economy is still growing at, yeah. you know, well, they're aiming for 5%. I see those forecasts have been downgraded to 4.7, 4.8-ish percent now. But, I mean, compared to South African growth, that's, that's, that's moving along quite nicely. So it's, it is a strange one, I think. They're trying to get consumption going in that economy, and, and we're just not seeing that yet. So um, I don't know if that 14-day rate that they've made a small adjustment to is going to move the needle in the, in, in the bigger picture. Um, but we'll see as time goes on if, if they do get increased appetite to stimulate a bit more, but not for the time being. Jordan, with that being said, do you think that, you know, perhaps uh, markets analysts did overestimate that recovery out from China? And that's why we're seeing, you know, this um, downbeat sentiment around the country's economy. 100%. And, and that's why I also continue to grapple with that, where I'm going, well, it's growing at a reasonable rate, but, you know, all the news coming out of there is not exactly positive. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it can't be underestimated. You know, the, the, we've talked a lot about Chinese property, but, you know, that can't be underestimated. There was a significant portion of household wealth in China invested in property. And I think, again, another contrast to South Africa is they have a very strong savings culture in China, whether it be in property um, or other assets. So I think... The battle is to get their economy to transition more to a consumption-led economy. You know, in the U.S., consumption or con uh, consumer spending is, you know, two-thirds. It's a huge part of GDP. So it's a big change that they're looking to make in China, and it's, I don't think, something that's going to happen overnight, um, and it's probably going to take quite a bit longer. 
and you know we the, the property overhang doesn't doesn't help um, help consumption there either. And let's move over to some local company news. We had Grand Parade out with numbers. Earnings surged as it managed to keep a tight lead lid on costs. I think what I found interesting there was the decrease in um, contributions from its gaming assets. I know, I guess, you know, looking at um, that gaming industry booming so much, you'd expect those um, earnings to be um, higher. I think it's, it, I agree with you on that. I think what is interesting about it to me is that, you know, maybe you see on the margins the consumer starting to feel a bit of pressure. You know, interest rates have been high for quite some time. And I think we always think that gambling sort of continues no matter what, but there's limits to all of these, these kind of um, trends or behaviors. So, you know, it might just be a bit of weakness in the consumer starting to come through. Hopefully that starts to turn now with, these, um, with the rate cut we've just had. Quarter, a quarter of a percent is not going to, you know, um, change the outcomes massively in the short term. But again, like I said, the same with the US, it's sort of potentially is this the new direction of travel and that we hopefully have future aid cuts to come, a little bit uh, less pressure on the consumer that may may enable them to to spend more money at, at, in uh, Grand West's uh, investment uh, companies. Not forgetting those contributions from the two pot once they, you know, of get course. into the economy, just boosting the economy as well. Now, um, before I let you go, let's get your stock pick. What are you choosing today? So today I'd like to talk about Nike. Uh -huh. um, everybody, I think, is pretty familiar with Nike, uh, one of the largest um, athletic shoe manufacturers on, on earth. And interestingly, um, you know, it obviously needs no explanation, but the brand has huge value. In terms of apparel brands, it's one of the most valuable on earth, ahead of the likes of you know, Gucci, Louis Vuitton. So an exceptionally valuable brand that I think has lost its way for, yeah. for some time. I'm sure if, the, if, the, if anyone's looking at the share price charts, it, you know, it's gone sideways to backwards for, for quite a few quite a few years and over shorter periods as well. So I think they battled a bit. They, they took a, an approach of a direct to consumer and um, sort of cut out some of the other retailers. And I think that worked well for them during COVID, but you know, things have started to normalize a bit and that strategy started to stumble. Um, the reason I also wanted to talk about it is they've announced that their CEO is gonna be replaced by a, a long time company veteran who's coming out of retirement. So I think that's interesting to see what happens there. The market seemed to like it. It was up quite significantly on the day. But I think one to keep an eye on, I think, um, you know, there's newer competitors in the space like an on cloud mm -hmm. and other businesses like that that have taken some shelf space at those other retailers um, that Nike now has to try and win back some some favor there. Um, I think on cloud, while it might be growing quickly, is still, you know, the revenues are still a fraction of what what Nike's are today. So an interesting one to keep an eye on. There's a lot more work to be done in their sort of restructuring plan and and trying to right size that business and get back to the business of, you know, making innovative products that, that people love. Just entertain me here for a bit. Now we've seen that, um, you know, there's been a change at the helm. So I guess we can say that Donahoe is not doing it for Nike anymore. Yeah, you know, it was interesting. I saw the founder of, Full, uh, of Nike, uh, Phil Knight, spoke, you know, initially when there was some talk a few weeks ago around this, he came out and, and, and defended the current CEO. Um, but that's changed quite quickly. Yeah. Um, and I, there was quite a good quote he had where he said he's really looking forward to seeing Nike gets back, get back on its pace, which is obviously a bit of a, a comment to, to its running heritage. But um, yeah, it'll be, it's a lot of pressure for the new CEO. There's a lot to be done there. And I think, I think more broadly speaking, the staff there, I think morale is, is, is a bit low. So there's some work to be done, not just on the product and innovation side, but also getting the staff to, to pull together behind the brand again and, and start moving back in the right direction. It'll be interesting to see how things play out on that end. Jordan, thanks so much Thank for you. your time and insights this evening. That was Jordan Toy from Legacy Family Wealth.